Hey, this is Joel Duff. Welcome back to my channel. I am doing something a little bit different here. I am going to respond to another YouTube uh, channel, and that is by uh, Zach Hancock. All right, Zach Hancock is a uh, uh, postdoctoral fellow at the University of Michigan and doing population genetics. Um, and he does some wonderful videos, ex explainer videos about population genetics and, and um, critical concepts in evolutionary biology. And so I highly recommend uh, his videos to you. And I watched this particular video, Design Diversity is Nonsense, yesterday. thought it was a really great video. He has a very clear way of explaining um, concepts like coalescence uh, and how genes and genomes are passed down uh, through time and how phylogenies are reconstructed. And he is critiquing the idea that organisms were created with some sort of large amount of genetic diversity and uh, and so therefore, new genetic diversity isn't created over time, but is simply endowed in organisms in their original creation. So right, he's critiquing a young earth creationist uh, viewpoint on the origin of diversity uh, in organisms and the, or the diversity of life on earth. And specifically, he's talking about this idea called created heterozygosity. So before I, now what I've done is I've started, you know, in response to his video, I, you know, it really did get me thinking. One of the things that got me thinking is like, how would a young earth creationist respond to this? Can I put on my young earth creationist hat and uh, take in everything that I've read about young earth creationism, creationism and the response and their views of genetics and imagine how to respond to what uh, Zach has um, sort of put out there as a challenge right, to young earth creationists. And so I started working on some figures to represent what I think young earth creationists are thinking is happening with genetics and, and population genetics in particular uh, and heredity. And uh, as I started working on those figures, I realized these are going to be really complex figures uh, in, in the long run, but they might be very useful things for me to develop over time. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to stop and I'm going to show the figures as I've, I've worked on them already to the point that they are. And I'm going to, you know, elicit feedback on them and see if what, where I'm going kind of makes sense to you, right? Is this something that I should continue to pursue and then make some more better videos than this one? Because I'm just going to be rambling, right? I'm just going to be talking through off the top of my head, the things that I've been thinking about since watching Zach's uh, video uh, and thinking about the responses I could make. Okay. So before I show you my my little figures, right? That I've been that I've been generating, uh, and try to explain them to you. Let's talk about this created heterozygosity thing, right? Zach didn't really show the background of of Nathaniel Jensen's uh, created heterozygosity idea. So let's take a look at that first, all right? And primarily, I'm going to this article from 2016 in the Answers Research Journal, which is the in-house journal of Answers in Genesis. Uh, this really long title on the origin of eukaryotic species, genotypic and phenotypic diversity, genetic clocks, population growth curves, and comparative nuclear genome analysis suggest created heterozygosity in combination with natural processes as a major mechanism. A major mechanism for what? For the origin of eukaryotic species. You see, young earth creationists have a speciation, well, uh, yeah, I'll call it a speciation problem how to explain the diversity and origins of diversity. Uh, since God simply didn't create every single individual species or each individual that's alive on earth, uh, he created different kinds that young earth creationists believe have exploded and turned into many, many different species or evolved into many different varieties. How does that occur? And the suggestion here is that the original created kinds had a tremendous amount of sort of diversity packed into a few individuals and then as those individuals have reproduced, right, and expanded their population, those that diversity has sort of spread out and then become isolated in different pockets, which we call species. And so it's the idea that you have created heterozygosity followed by natural processes like natural selection, genetic drift, ah, and even sprinkle in a few mutations to create some new variants. And voila, you get thousands and thousands and thousands of new species within a fairly short period of time, right? Just 4,500 years, right? I would say this is one of the, the main articles if you wanted to try to understand their viewpoint uh, on this. So let's just hit just a few highlights, which is the actual description of his concept, right? 
In the study, we attempt to advance the Young Earth Creationist model by articulating a testable, predictable hypothesis, which we term created heterozygosity and natural processes. So that's the CHNP model or hypothesis. In short, the CHNP hypothesis is a version of the hypothesis previously referred to as the fractionation of created alleles slash fractionation of heterozygosity. All right. You have a whole bunch of heterozygotes. Heterozygotes are you and I are diploids. We have two copies of our genome. And if you have one version of a, of a gene that you got from your mom and another version of gene you got from your dad, so they're slightly different versions or maybe very different versions of that particular gene sort of telling you do this or do this or some combination of the two, then you are heterozygous at that particular position, right? Hetero being different. You, you have differences. And so if organisms were created with vast amounts of heterozygosity, like every single gene and every single locus in our genome, we had differences at every one of those locations. Then maybe you could fractionate those differences into pools of homozygosity, all right? Characters, individuals that have that express one character versus another pool of individuals that express a different character and therefore those pools of individuals look different, maybe even behave different, maybe are able to interact differently or can't interact in the same way they could before, like sexually un unable to interact, and therefore remain separate genetic pools after that. And that's what we kind of call species. That's what we refer to as species often. Like the latter, the CHNP hypothesis proposes that diploid individuals were created heterozygous and that the natural process since since this event, including, now this is very important, recombination, gene conversion, mutations, natural selection, toss in genetic drift there, that's the part of the ETC, have distributed and or added to the original created genetic diversity. Notice that? Not only just distributed the variation into different groups or separate isolated populations, but have also added to the original created diversity. That's the idea of mutations are actually adding new diversity to populations, thus producing the genotypic and consequently phenotypic diversity we observe today. So this is the hypothesis. Now, I'm going to read the next couple paragraphs here before we get back to me explaining uh, my little figures, which are trying to respond to uh, Zach. To be sure, this is not a deistic hypothesis. God didn't just sort of like create all this variation and just like let it go. Let's see what happens. Like, let's see what how they recombine and and that because that sounds like randomness, right? They randomly just recombine and create other individuals that are different. Uh, they were all possible, right? Sort of like I created all these possibilities and then, you know, time starts to flow and things just happen i know they that's not the way that's not way the way they're seeing it they're seeing it as this isn't a deistic process winding up the clock and letting it go under the chnp model god doesn't create and then abandon his creation step away and just kind of look at it from afar rather the chnp model recognizes that god is actively involved in his creation uh, providentially upholding it to this day and the model recognizes that god works via means mechanisms, like all the natural laws that he has put into place and upholds, right? Including the environment, right? The environment is sculpting, shaping, influencing the direction in which organisms are, are selected, right? Those are natural processes. And those natural processes are, are what? They're supernaturally designed, right? Natural selection is a supernaturally designed process put in place in organisms to allow them the capacity to adapt and respond to the environment. And so he's upholding his creation and intimately involved in that sense, upholding the processes that are governing how organisms interact with one another. <laughs> what my, my response to this for, for Jeanson is, uh, oh, this is Jeanson and Lyle actually, but this is mostly Nathaniel Jeanson uh, in this paper. Uh, my response to this is, welcome to theistic evolution. And welcome to evolutionary creationism. Because well, that's essentially what evolutionary creationists believe. I mean, this, this line is 
is saying what theistic evolutionists say uh, about the origins of diversity. All right, but let's continue. As an additional point of clarification, our CHNP model does not reject the operation of mutations, transposal, uh, transpositional elements, or the like. Instead, we propose that kinds, right, the kinds of things God created in, in the seven days or six days of creation, right, during those six days, God created the initial miraculous creation separate from his providential upholding of things, supernaturally created genomes, hetero, heterozygous genomes, and that the genetic variety in these genomes was modified not only by recombination and other reshuffling processes, but also by mutational processes. Wow, this is really, this is really, really interesting because actually this is contrary to the typical way that young earth creationists talk. Um, because they rarely want to acknowledge that mutations have some kind of active role in, um, in adapting and altering organisms. And here it sounds like that's what they're saying, right? And actually that is what they're saying, although they have, they have limits on this, All right? So they're saying that there can be, there's recombination, there's reshuffling. Well, that's reshuffling and recombining the variation that they believe was divinely created, right? in the original creation or the original organisms, original kinds. And then you sprinkle on top over time mutations and that adds a little more, that adds a little spice to organisms, right? It gives them a little more flair, a few more interesting variants, right? He would see the limits there. Like you can't, you can't add enough variants that you create another kind. Although um, if, if anyone's actually that interested, <laughs> it's, this is tough reading. But Jensen and Lyle actually do have quite a discussion in this paper about the limits of kinds and what could possibly provide a limit because they recognize that the process of lots, having lots of variation and then adding mutations could potentially lead to different descendants that are so different that they appear to be different kinds of organisms, right? Completely isolated and having uh, novel functions potentially which would make them seem like they're different kinds, at least from our earthly you know, creaturely perspective versus God's perspective. Um, and so that's that they recognize that this is a, this is a challenge to them. All right. And that, so that's an interesting part of this paper, but, but we're not going to talk about that. Um, oh, I didn't read the last part of that sentence only at rates consistent with documented genetic processes and parameters. Hmm. Interesting. He's, they're not going to employ, extra fast mutations in the past. They're going to say that mutations are occurring at the rates that we can observe today. Although I would dispute their actual uh, values that they think that mutations are occurring today. I think that they misunderstand those, but nonetheless, they think that they are applying current rates of mutations and extrapolating back. And they're saying um, with current rates of mutations, um, and then this, this is really the crux of the issue. They recognize that at the current rate of mutation, you can't create enough mutation. You can't create enough variety to explain all the different variants in organisms alive today. There's too much genetic variation in a species, and especially if you consider as many, many species together as a kind. There's way too many variants to explain, be explained by mutations adding those. Uh, remember, this is within the Young Earth Creationist Framework, so they only have 4,500 years to work with since, since Noah's flood, right? The great bottleneck. Uh, so in 4,500 years, they recognize you can't create too many variants and therefore, but we obviously observe there's a lot of variants. And so where do they come from? That's where this idea of created heterozygosity comes from, right? It's a necessity. There's nothing in the Bible that says that God made organisms with high amounts of genetic diversity built into just two individuals or a few individuals. Um, this is an inference and it's a required, it, it, it's required by observation, which they actually make a big deal about in this paper. They're observing the world today. They can't explain all the mute, all these variants through mutations, and therefore they have to have been originally created, miraculously created variation. And since that time, what they're emphasizing here is mutations have been adding to that gene pool by adding new variants. Um, but since there's only been 4,500 years, not that many new variants could be added. And those variants probably aren't like really significant variants. They're like, eh, 
a new hair color or a new this or a, you know, a slightly different version of this enzyme or right something that's just within a, a genetic system that kind of tweaks it not something that would give you a fundamental new character new characteristic that would make you fundamentally different than other members of your kind and that's how they limit kinds to being able to or not being able to evolve into other kinds because there's a, there just hasn't been enough time although presumably if they thought that the world was going to continue for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands more years, they would run into a problem, all right? Because there would be an accumulation of mutations that potentially could create new kinds. Um, well, except there's genetic entropy, right? I, I, you know, many of these same creationists believe that genetic entropy is destroying genomes at the same time, that they're also creating species and, and wonderful new things. I, yes, it's kind of a weird juxtaposition. All right, I'm going to stick to, I got to get to my figures. I got to get to the thing I want to show you. But let's read this last little bit. In other words, our model invokes a single biblically justified miracle, the miracle being creation of heterozygosity. Um, invokes means we necessarily need this, even though we aren't told by the Bible it's there. This is something we can, uh, we can import into the Bible and say this must have happened, that there was a biblical miracle uh, at creation during the creation week. And then what do we do? We invoke observable natural processes thereafter. Everything that's happened since the creation is just observable natural processes at rates that are consistent with our observations today because the basic functioning of the world has remained the same. Right? That form of uniformitarianism is, is, is still in operation. Um, thus, since our model is free of ad hoc miracles, hmm, see, this is really interesting. See, they don't... I've tried to tell people this, and I'm glad this is written here this way. Young Earth creationists, they want to avoid employing miracles. They do it all the time because they kind of have to. The heat problem, and there's lots of other things you can come up with. It. They kind of like just say, like, God did it or something happened. Um, that More mir miraculous happened. But Jensen and Lyle are trying to avoid miracles. They want to say that God is finished with his creation and he's not creating anything new, fundamentally new. New variants, yes, but not like fundamentally new kinds of organisms. And therefore, they can't employ, they're not going to employ miracles in this process. And so their model is what they claim is free of ad hoc miracles and otherwise unobservable natural processes. They want to say this is just science. Our models meet uh, our model meets this first half of the criteria for the third test above genetic plausibility at the level of gen okay yeah they're referring to stuff they talked about before but i want to go over that okay are we ready okay so that that got me thinking and actually this is i mean it's actually zach that got me thinking um because he was showing how uh he was talking about um if you have created heterozygosity um how can i explain this you know what? I'm not going to explain it because I'm not going to explain it nearly as well as he does. So I'm just going to tell you to watch his video. It's, it's not that long. All right. So watch his video um, to get the gist of why he, he thinks that um, it's silly to think of this idea of created heterozygosity as being a problem solver uh, for young earth creationists in the timeline that they have, or even in a long timeline. Right? It doesn't make sense. Let me explain what, what I'm thinking here. Uh, and then Zach, if you ever watch this, it would be really interesting having a conversation about uh, how would you respond to this? Like, what's wrong with this? Because obviously you think that you're going to think that it's wrong, right? And and I'm still trying to figure out how wrong it is. I, I, I have a few ideas. But here's what I think young earth creationists think is happening. All right. I think this is what they think they're saying, <laughs> if, that make, if that makes any sense at all. And why don't I just explain this and then it'll be more clear. Okay, where to begin here with my figure? Um, let's use the most charismatic, charismatic example, right? The, of, a, of a kind, of a kind of organism, Homo sapiens. And this kind has an original created pair. All right, so we have Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve don't have parents. And yet, um, young earth creationists would say that both of those both Adam and Eve had uh, two pairs of chromosomes. They're diploid organisms like you and I, right? I don't, there's no proof of that, but let's just give them that uh, assumption, all right? That presupposition. 
that they are diploid and they had 46 chromosomes. And I'm only showing you chromosome number one. All right, so let's just focus on one chromosome and what happens to one chromosome. And so Adam had two copies of chromosome number one. And he didn't get one from his father and one from his mother because he didn't have a father and mother, right? So God just created two copies of chromosome number one. And what young Earth, what Nathaniel Jameson is saying is he needs and Eve needs to have optimal amounts, like as much variation packed into their genome as possible. And the only way to do that is you have to have a difference between the one chromosome and the other. That's where you get variation from. If you if, if your mom and your dad give you the exact same version of a gene, you're homozygous, you're the same between the, there's no variation there. They have to have given you different versions. And so what I've drawn here is I've drawn a chromosome and I've said, just to keep it simple, because this chromosome has a hundred million base pairs on it, individual A, T, C's and G's, of which any number of millions and millions of them could be variants compared one chromosome to another, uh, one copy of chromosome to another. But I've just said, like, here's nine variants, right? And the blue is just saying, I mean, this, this is a particular locus right here. And uh, it has an A at that particular position, right? And the, the, the tan stuff is the same, right? The same sequence, A, T, C, G, C, G. You know, it's the same on the chromosome number one copy versus the, the B version copy. I don't know what to call them because it's not father and mother's version, right? Uh, and so there's the same sequence there there's no variation there i mean honestly there there has to be places where there's no there is no variation otherwise we would have totally we'd make totally different products and and one chromosome would not be human being and the other one would be human being right there has to be a tremendous amount of similarity between those two there has to be lots of homozygosity among most of the bases of your genome of your chromosomes uh, your chromosome pairs in order for you to be the, the, the species that you are, the, the kind that you are. But there's going to be variants. We know that because we look around and we see there's differences between us, and those differences are genetic, most of them. And so I've just indicated nine different sites. In this case, uh, the A version has an A, and the other chromosome has a C at that particular spot. And so they're different, right? That's created heterozygosity. And then this next variant site, there's a G there, and the other copy has an A. And I didn't do all the letters for all these others, but this would be the same thing. We're just gonna we're just, we're just gonna work with single nucleotide variations, right? Just single base pair differences, which is the vast majority of differences um, between different individuals, different chromosomes and individuals. And then let's say we have Eve, and let's say Eve has uh, nine different variants at those nine different nine sequences particular base pairs at sites and they happen to be all different than adam's two chromosomes right so that's why i'm indicating a and c but eve has a g uh adam has a g and an a but adam but eve has a c you see how there's potentially four different possible bases you could have at any particular location on the chromosome position number 1,625,422, at that particular spot, you could have four different bases. Um, and so, at, so Eve has a G, and on her other chromosome, she has a T. And at this particular spot, I'm saying she's got a C, and their other position, she has a T. So Eve herself has a heterozygote. And then Eve is completely different than Adam. Right? But she has to have enough similar places in order for her and Adam to both be human beings. Right, So they have differences, but they have to have enough similarity also. So this would be a lot of, this would be the maximum amount of heterozygosity you could possibly have really in the human population at an individual location because there are only four bases. Right? So <laughs> that's the max you can have at any particular location. And then when you consider two people, they could have a lot of variants across the entire chromosome. There could be millions of different locations that are different between Adam and Eve, or there could just be thousands, all right? And that'd be the total amount of heterozygosity, some measure of that. All right, so what I've done is I have maximized heterozygosity such that every one of Adam's chromosomes, all nine, all these nine spots are places where there's differences. Everything else is 100% the same. 
And on Eve, at all those same spots, she is completely different at those spots. All right, and this is a simple model. You know, there's other places where maybe Adam has the same version, but Eve has something different. That would also be, um, that would be genetic variation in the population. It wouldn't be genetic variation within an individual, but it would be within a population, a population of two. Okay, now, let's say this is, this is genetic variation on one chromosome. All right, now, let's, uh, let's reproduce, right? Be fruitful and multiply. So Adam and Eve obey that command and they donate to their offspring. What do they do? They donate one of their chromosomes. They have two copies of chromosome number one, they each do, and they both say, look, my kid's got to have two copies of chromosome number one, so what, what can I do? I can't give them both because my spouse has also got to give something too, right? And we're equal contributors. Um, and so Adam gives a copy of chromosome number one and Eve gives a copy of chromosome one. What I've done is I've picked out, Adam's given the one that has all nine of these particular variants, and Eve is given one that has all these nine variants, and they're both completely different at each of those sites, right? And we call this, another word for this, by the way, is this is one haplogroup. Um, they're all connected together, right? So this is, this is the group, this is a, a giant allele, a giant block of genetic information that's being passed from one generation to the next. Uh, and so that's in the egg and that's in the sperm. The egg and sperm meet, right? And what do they do? They make Cain, right? And when they make Cain, Cain now has two copies of chromosome number one. Now this is happening with all the other chromosomes too. The X and the Y are slightly different, but it's still two copies of the sex chromosomes. Uh, and so what, is, what does Cain have? Well, Cain has um, these nine things that are different than these nine. You know, the, the, Cain is truly completely heterozygous, right? Every single one of these locations is different, right? And so it, it, Cain is as heterozygous as Adam was himself and Eve was herself. And um, this is what they've got. Now, does Cain doesn't represent all the genetic variation of Adam and Eve, right? He only represents 50% of it because all of these are lost and all of these are lost. All those variants are gone if Adam and Eve only had one child. Now, Adam and Eve are going to have other children, right? And so next time when Adam makes a sperm that happens to be the winner of the fertilization event, um, this particular chromosome could get passed to the next generation. So another child would have a, a, the other complete set of variants and might combine that with the other set of variants with Eve, or Eve could combine the same set of variants with this alternative set of variants from Adam. All right, you get the idea. You get recombination, so therefore you get new combinations in the offspring. And when you get blue and gray, two different base pairs that weren't present in Adam, they may have to interact with each other differently. This is making us, you know, G is making one protein, like this chromosome is making uh, one particular protein right here. And this other chromosome at that particular gene that has an A and is making a slightly different protein. And they're having to interact somehow and they make a phenotype. And so Cain might have a different, you know, a slightly different characteristic than either of their parents because they have a different combination now. Great. So we're showing how you get recombinant. You know, I'm, I'm trying to show what Nathaniel Jensen and others are trying to suggest is happening. So far, this is not unreasonable at all. In fact, I'm using a really simple model and I have another slide coming up, which we're going to complicate it uh, with some crossing over. All right, let's take this a couple steps further. All right, you got Cain. He kills Abel and then he is sent out outside of Eden. Uh, and uh, to a foreign land, right, out into the wilderness, and uh, he's going to start a city, okay? Uh, and so it's so like you're banished, right, from the rest of the family. Now, presumably, he must have taken somebody with him because you can't start a city with one individual, uh, and so he must have taken one of his sisters with him, right? Adam and Eve had a bunch of kids, had girls and boys, and Cain must have taken one of his sisters with him as a wife, so let's just call her Ruth. We don't, we don't know whether Cain had a wife or not. Um, 
well, I guess I'm inferring that he must have, right? Since he goes out to start a, uh, to start a, a, a city, unless he enticed some other family members uh, to come with and some other guys from the family. Um, but then again, that would be a, a short-lived city if you just took a bunch of guys with you. So he takes his sister, Ruth, and Ruth is an offspring of Adam and Eve. Well, now how did she get the genes that she has? How did she get the variants that she has? Well, here I'm showing you another combination. Like every time you, every time you have an offspring, right? You have uh, equal likelihood of choosing one copy of the chromosome versus the other. So it's a 50-50 shot in terms of what you're going to pass to your kids. But this is what in Angel Genes would say is a natural process, a natural process that God has instituted. Uh, but now that us, that is, this is a natural process, which you know would we would define stochastic well we define in a statistical way right to us it looks like it's a 50 50 chance you can't know which one it's going to be you and i right we can't look at it and i can't tell you i can't predict for you which chromosome which copy of the chromosome is going to end up in the offspring until i see it later uh what did she get she got uh all the same chromosome that has these uh gray variants uh and so that was the same as Cain. And she got the other chromosome from Adam, all right? So for chromosome number one, she's not the same as Cain, right? She's got different variants of that particular gene. Uh, and this would be true for the other chromosomes as well, all right? So she's gonna have a different combination of Adam and Eve in her. Great, so there's the two of them. Now, they're gonna have kids, right? They've got kids, so their first child is Cain Jr. Right now, Kane Jr. Um, here's what could happen. Uh, it could take the chromosome, the second chromosome from Ruth, the one that she got from her mom, and then she could take the chromosome, the, the chromosome from Kane, which is also the one he got from his mother. All right, so both Kane and Ruth got a chromosome number one from their mother. They got the same chromosome, and now it's possible to combine. Ruth's and Cain's chromosomes and put them together. So Cain Jr. actually has the exact same genetic profile for chromosome number one that mom had for just one chromosome. Now, what we've done, what I'm doing here is I'm showing you how genetic diversity can be lost very quickly. <laughs> very quickly in a small population, right? Especially a small population within breeding, where in, and obviously Adam's family, highly inbred. Um, and so if they have a couple more children, right, there's a good chance you're going to have, because both of these have uh, all gray uh, variants here, right? There's a good chance many of them are going to have all those variants, that combination of variants. And several more might have be homozygous for all of those, right? So King Jr. has, has no heterozygosity at, at, at chromosome number one. Absolutely none at all. Both chromosomes are identical to one another, unless they added a new mutation. Right, that's the way you introduce new that's the way you introduce new variants, right? In order for new ones to come back into the population, either the same variants come back in the population or brand new ones, gotta have mutations. All right, so there's Cain Jr. Um, he's completely homozygous, and other children from this um, from this pair, right, probably would have very low uh, heterozygosity as well. Um, Okay, so this shows that you can have rapid loss of variation. And then eventually, Cain Jr. is going to have to have offspring with other sisters, right? Uh, because there's no one else around if he's left to form a city. And so he has to, so Cain Jr. has to have offspring with his sister. What if his sister has all gray, right? All the same variants. And then maybe has one of those other ones, right? Their offspring are going to have even more opportunities, even greater statistical likelihood of having more homozygosity from that. And what you're going to have is you're going to have inbreeding and you have constant loss of variation until eventually you're going to have very little, very little variation. This is happening in all the chromosomes. All right. As long as that population stays very small, and no new variation, no new um, variants are introduced, either through mutation or migration from other individuals from other populations that might have the other combinations of, of alleles that Adam and Eve had. Okay, now, 
before I go to the more complex model, all right, because in reality, chromosomes cross over at meiosis. So when Adam and Eve go to make sperm and egg, they're going to do this process called meiosis, or at least we assume that Adam and Eve did meiosis, right? Nobody was there. Were you there to see their chromosomes do um, uh, crossing over? I wasn't, but for the sake of argument, let's say they did. Uh, and a crossing over course will mix the two chromosomes together prior to passing them on to the next generation. And that's a way that you can reshuffle the variation that's there. And that's what young earth creationists want to do is they want to say like, you take all this variation and then you just allow it to, to remix and reshuffle and recombine. And that's going to then create new opportunities for combinations that couldn't have existed before. Uh, but before I go there, let me back up. Oh, no, no, I do need to go forward. I do need to go forward. Sorry. I do have to talk about crossing over before I want to hit this other topic. Uh, let's go back to Jensen real quick. Human haplotype block predictions. So a little farther down the article. Adam and Eve were assumed to have been created with nuclear DNA heterozygosity, implying their genomes represented the first haplotype blocks. That's why I called each one of these things a single haplotype, right? The haplotype would be all of all the individual uh, sites on this particular chromosome. It's really all millions of them, right? Represents a single block of genetic information right? that's being passed the next generation. And he's got two blocks for chromosome number one. You can pass this one eh, or this one to the next generation. Um, since they were only in, they were the only individuals alive, their haplotype blocks were essentially the length of the entire chromosome. Therefore, every recombination and gene conversion event since the creation of their genomes would fragment these initially long blocks into smaller haplotype blocks. Right? And Jensen thinks this is going to be like the thing that can save species populations from going completely homozygous really, really fast. Right. Hopefully what I just showed you at least gives you a hint that homozygosity is going to happen pretty quick. And what's happening is you're just losing variants along the way very, very quickly. Um, all right. So let's go to model number two. Right. Let's complicate things a little bit more. Uh, we got Adam and Eve. Well, they're the same. Right. They've started with uh, a large amount of genetic diversity. Lots of heterozygosity. Each individual has heterozygosity, and then there's even more genetic diversity when you consider the two individuals together as a population. They then go to make sperm and egg. Well, to do so, they have to do meiosis. And in the meiotic process, the pairs of chromosomes, pair chromosome pair number one, will get very close to each other and they will cross over at places and the chromosomes break off and fuse to the other end of the other chromosome. So they swap pieces of chromosome. Now, this is a really nifty process. So what it ends up doing is now I'm trying to show you down here in my uh, in my uh, sperm here. You can see I've got blue, 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 five blues. And then there is sort of green, uh, black or gray and white and light blue. That is the same as this right here. Green, black, tan and light blue. These four right here. So what happened here is. What has happened is we've had a crossing over event right here. The chromosomes intertangled with one another right here. And this chromosome got attached to this chromosome. And this chromosome got attached to this chromosome. And then Adam at a 50, 50, he's going to have to give one chromosome to his offspring. And so the chromosome he gave to his offspring is this chromosome right here. It's this and this. And that's the chromosome right there. Okay, gives that to, puts it in the sperm. Now, he actually made another sperm, right, at the same time. And the other sperm has the other combination. But that other sperm, during that particular encounter, all right, that competition for the egg, um, for fertil in fertilization, lost out, all right? And this particular sperm is the winner. And therefore, that is the, gen those are the alleles, the variants that are going to get past the next generation. All right, what happened to uh, Eve? Well, she's got a crossover event that occurred right here, right there. 
And so what she's passing to her offspring is this chromosome right here, right? At least to Cain. So Cain gets this thing right here. And he also gets this from Adam. And so now we see those two come together and that's what his chromosome number one is. So he's got a new combination. Right, he's combining um, this blue gene with this uh, this uh, orangish one here, right? And which which Adam didn't have, right? And Eve didn't have that combination. So once again, newer they're going to express those genes in slightly different ways. And so uh, Cain should look different than Adam and Eve. He should have similar characteristics to Adam and similar characteristics to Eve, but some things are are different because of this new combination. Great. And you're like, okay, that's fine. But what you've done is you've broken the haplotype, right? Or haploblock. And that block was, right? So instead of having this whole thing right here, now you have these, these variants, these versions of the chromosome are connected to these versions of the chromosome rather than these versions of the rest of the chromosome. And so we're going to get a brand new combination, two chromosomes that now have swapped some of their variants. And so there's a lot of heterozygosity here, right? Great. And then once again, Cain uh, takes his sister, Ruth, uh, and uh, they're going to have children. And Ruth also got chromosomes from her mom, but her chromosomes are just two, these two right here combined with these. So the crossing over event occurred right here for Eve. Every egg is different. Every sperm is different. Meiosis each time crossing over to, happens in a different place. Again, it's it's rather hard to predict exactly where, where crossing over is going to occur. We can statistically talk about where it's going to occur uh, or what the frequency is or what the what, how many times you can expect that to happen at this position versus another. But I can't say with surety each individual time it's going to happen there. Uh, so it appears to be uh, random to us. All right, so Ruth's got a whole different set. Now, you'll notice that between Cain and Ruth now, we're actually missing uh, some things. Like, there's no blue allele here. See this right here? There's no blue allele. Because of the crossing over event, we happen to have missed the blue allele altogether. Uh, and so now, Cain and Ruth, neither of which have the blue allele, that particular variant, Maybe it's an A, okay, at that, at that particular location, and it affects a particular gene in some way and makes a particular phenotype. Uh, that is no longer in the population, right? If Cain and Ruth are a new population in a new city and they're going to found a new population, they are finding a, they're founding a population that lacks that variant. So just this process of crossing over, even within, even within one generation, you're losing variation. And this is happening on all the chromosomes, all right? So you're going to have lost some variation. Ruth has also lost a variant as well. And then when they reproduce with one another and more, make Cain Jr., you see you can still have the opportunity to maybe have a bunch of heterozygosity. Here's some heterozygosity, but here's a bunch of homozygosity. Yet Cain Jr. becomes kind of a hodgepodge, just like you're a hodgepodge of all your grandparents. You don't have a you got a chromosome from your mom, right? But your mom was, when she gave you that chromosome, she mixed her parents' chromosomes together and crossed them over. So you get a little bit of grandma and a little bit of grandpa for chromosome number one. And they had done the same thing. So you got a little bit of great grandma and great grandpa and your other great grandma and your other great grandpa. All four of them potentially are in you in different little chunks. So different haplotypes, right? In this case, the haplotype is this particular group kind of has traveled together these particular four variants are traveling together. But they might get crossed over and separated, and so the haplogroups become smaller. And that's how the genetic variation eventually gets scattered all over the place, right? Eventually, you know, this particular blue allele could find its way onto this chromosome over here, blue with all the rest being gray, right? And this orange one might eventually find its way uh, onto this chromosome right here through crossing over and then have blue ones and then maybe orange, but then it crosses over again and gets rid of the other blue. So now it only has orange with, I'm sorry, the blues come back over here through crossing over and you still have the orange there, right? So you can get every new combination eventually. 
So this is what young earth creationists are seeing is happening. And then what they're saying is there's hundreds of thousands of these variants across Adam and Eve, all up and down chromosome number one and two. And they're then swapping back and forth, creating all new variants, which then have new phenotypes. And then those phenotypes are being selected by natural processes, natural selection. They're also genetically drifting. And then sometimes there's brand new variants that crop up that add new variants to the population. Um, so this is their, their thinking that God could have just put in massive amounts of genetic variation into the first pair. I got to take a small tangent here. Um, this takes quite a leap because Eve, remember, was made from the side of Adam. So for young earth creationists in their particular literalistic interpretation, right, Eve is created from the physical substance of Adam, not from the ground itself. And if Eve was taken from Adam and sculpted, right, her, wouldn't that include her genetics? And if that's the case, um, Eve should have the same alleles and genetics as Adam. In fact, that's a question in young earth creationism is then where does the X chrom you know, where does the extra X chromosome come from? You know, Adam had an X and a Y, but if he's just taking that stuff and forming Eve, then God had to miraculously create a second X chromosome that Adam didn't have. Um, but like I said, that's an aside. Uh, but it, it, the idea is because young earth creationists need so much variation and want so much variation, they suggest that Eve had completely different alleles than Adam had at thousands, hundreds of thousands of different locations. Well, what they're suggesting then is that God performed a miracle of creating brand new variation for Eve from Adam's genome um, in, a, in some miraculous way. Um, and for which there's, yeah, yeah. It, there's all speculation on young earth creations in, in young earth creationist world. All right, now I, I want to up the ante. I know what Zach's going to say to this. Uh, a couple things he's going to say to this. Um, and so, I want to point out that what young earth creationists really need, because I'm talking about this like as a whole chromosome, and then here's a bunch of variants on the chromosome. And sure, they're going to get crossed over, and so you can get lots and lots. You can get millions of different combinations. But now what I want to do is I want to say, um, the thing is, young earth creationists need to explain the variation within individual genes. That's the real challenge. right? You take a typical gene. Um, that's just ABO, the ABO gene, the gene that confers the... Um, the phenotype that we call A type blood, B type blood, O type blood, and AB type blood, right? Those are the four major phenotypes. Um, there's actually a lot more genetic variants that create those because there's an A1, there's an A2, there's an O1, there's an O2, there's an O3, there's an A3, there's an AV1, there's a, all right, there's a whole bunch of other variants of blood type if you really want to get down into the details. Um, and so let's just say that there's, there's more than this, but let's keep it simple. Let's say there's 25 variants of the ABO gene. 25 different variants. All right, where do they all come from? All right, that's the, that's the thing. So let's go back to Adam and Eve. And here I'm going to try to, again, I'm going to try to represent young earth creationism. So here, here I'm trying to respond to Zach and what he would like maybe try to say about this. And I'll try to make up an answer from young earth creationists. Let's say that uh, this is, let me get rid of my ink here. Let's say that this is one gene now. So this is a huge chromosome that's uh, millions of base pairs long, but uh, hundreds of millions of base pairs long. And we're just taking one little small section of it. And this section is just 10,000 base pairs. And this 10,000 base pairs is a single gene, a single location on this huge chromosome that codes for a particular protein, right? It codes for a protein that is going to make a phenotype, right? It's gonna, in, it's gonna create either, it's either a structural protein, like, like a protein that's in your hair um, or your muscle, or it's an enzyme. And that enzyme has a job to do chemical chemistry wise. And so it, it, is, it makes something in you. So that's your phenotype, whatever it does. 
So let's say this is just one gene. Now that one gene uh, has like the ABO gene. If I just said we have 25 different variants, 25 different possible um, alleles of that, most people say like, well, Adam and Eve only had four, right? They only have four chromosomes, four copies of that gene. Adam and Eve should have only had four copies of the ABO gene. You have two. My wife has two. So between the two of us, we have four copies. And so if you say like, well, how many different haplotypes do we have? Well, the entire gene is one haplotype. That's, that's what this is here. If you have all these different places that are different than the other chromosome, but all of these are connected to each other because it's all one gene. And that represents the package of variation that makes a type blood. And over here, all these differences combined make O type blood. Right? So that's your, that's your haplotype group. Um, and so what it's tempting to say is that, okay, well, Adam and Eve, or you, my, myself, my wife, we can only have four real alleles or haplotype groups. One, two, three, four. Now, how do we get 25? 25 different combinations. All right. How do we get that 25 different alleles is what I, I should probably be using that word for um, for the ABO thing. There's 25 different alleles and depending on how they combine, you get your different phenotypes. All right. So where would they all come from? I think young earth creationists would say, OK, that's not true. You don't you don't need to. Adam and Eve didn't need they don't have just four copies. What they have is. They have a whole bunch of different variants. In other words, they have lots of heterozygosity, just like this. So let's say this is one gene, and now you've got nine different locations here that are all different between Adam and Eve. That's nine differences. And then these are all different. That's a nine more difference. And these are all different than these. That's nine more differences still. Right? That's a whole bunch of different variants in this one gene. And then they would claim. Oh, we're going to do just what I showed you here. What if you cross these over? Yeah, sure. In the simple model, Adam could only pass down this group together. Like I'm giving you one copy of this gene and that's what you're getting. All this particular set of, of sequence. And that's what you're going to have. And Eve says, I got to give you one of these two. And so therefore you can only have you know, there's two different versions you're getting, or you could get these other versions. In other words, there really are only four things that are getting passed back and forth between offspring. But wait, the younger creation says, look, there's this thing called crossing over. Okay. What about crossing over? You could have lots of different locations in that gene that have variation. And then you could have crossing over and that would recombine these variants with different variants providing for a chromosome that now has a new combination that didn't exist in Adam and Eve and therefore creates a new phenotype in their offspring. But those variants, all those individual base pairs actually existed in the original creation and God created them. That's created heterozygosity, which leads to new combinations and greater variation expressed in the offspring than in the original parents. I think this would be the essence of what um, young earth creations, when they try to talk about this, are, are thinking in their mind is happening. Great. Uh, you still have the problem, even if there was crossing over at a high rate, you still have the problem of if you're in a small population and like Cain, goes off with his sister and then has three or four offspring, they're going to lose a huge number of those variants. Right. So under any of these models, you're rapidly losing variation. 20, 30, 40 percent of the variation is probably going to be lost in the first 15 or 20 generations um, through this effect. Right. Because these are linked to each other. There are there are haplotype groups. So I'm going to back up. Um, what's the problem here? What's the problem here? Doesn't it look like you could have 
like all the genetic variation in the ABO gene or in your insulin gene or whatever gene you want to pick out. And you want to say like, people will say, oh, there's a hundred variants of that particular gene in the human population, but Adam and Eve could only had four. So where did all the rest come from? Those come from mutations. Now, this is what, this is what Nathaniel Jensen is saying doesn't happen, right? He's saying, he's admitting that mutation rates are relatively low. And if you look at how, what, how long it takes to accumulate new mutations in the population, that we wouldn't have as many variants as we have in the human population in just 4,500 years, right? So therefore, he needs to find all the variation in the original creation, hence created heterozygosity. You, you, he has to front load all the variation in the population and then allow it to just remix and reshuffle, get resorted, and then natural processes select the, the new sorted variants, the new packages, right? And say, well, that package is pretty good for this particular environment. And then they, they cross with each other and they become more homozygous, but they're also adapted for that environment. So you end up with this species and then you end up with another species, you end up with another species. Although for human beings, that doesn't happen, right? We're all one species. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what prevents human beings from speciating as much as other species if we we're created with the same amount of created heterozygosity at the beginning as other kinds were. Um, I mean, I guess presumably other kinds could have started with more individuals than two, right? In which case, more variation. Ah, but I haven't got to the problem yet. All right, and this is a little trickier. Um, okay, I said that crossing over would shuffle these and therefore kind of gets the creationist out of the bind and says that, yes, there could be a hundred variants encoded into Adam and Eve's single gene because they're at different positions in the gene. There's multiple locations in the gene which can affect the phenotype. And so you can have four sets that create four different phenotypes, four sets of alleles, that depending on which common, oh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, see, this is why I'm doing this, right? Uh, this is actually why I'm, I'm going through this process. I, I'm thinking about how to be as clear as possible with my figures. Um, there's so many nuances to genetics. I'm, I'm, I, I keep finding myself wanting to go down tangents to give you exceptions. So I'll back up again. I think it's true. I, th I think... I think the young earth creationist, there's some merit to the idea, the initial idea they have that Adam and Eve could have had lots and lots and lots of different variants for a particular gene, right? Encoded in their four copies of their chromosomes, right? And then the idea is that you'd have crossing over, which would then release those, recombine those different variants, creating all the different possible phenotypes. And so that's where Jensen says, well, like, yeah, 90% of all the variation uh, in all the genes that we see could have been in the original pair at the very beginning. All right. I'm going to tell you one problem, and then I'm hoping Zach will uh, probably come up with three or four other problems I haven't thought about. Uh, but this is what hit me right away. Uh, and this is one of the things I think is really unrealistic about this model. In addition to everything Zach said in his particular in his talk, which you should go watch, um, crossing over does it occur within genes, right? Because their model requires lots of crossing over to happen. It has to cross over to recombine in order to create all this 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 expression of variation and new combinations in order for all these other natural processes to very quickly create all these different species. Sure, crossing over happens a lot. All right, and let me let me just draw this out again. You have two chromosomes, and they might uh, intermingle at meiosis, and this is the crossing over point right here. All right, so you're you're recombining. This chromosome now gets attached to maybe this chromosome to create this new combination. Almost every meiotic event, like for Adam and Eve for every sperm and egg that they formed, their chromosomes went through this crossing over event. And they might've crossed over in one place, potentially crossed over in two different places on the same at the same time. Uh, so yes, crossing over happens a lot. Hmm, that is relative. Does it happen a lot? 
Well, if the chromosome is 100 million base pairs long and it crosses over one time, there's only one location out of 100 million base pairs that actually did the crossing over. So you have a massive chunk of stuff that's still together and did not get split up. Right? The crossing over event did separate the chromosomes. Like, you know, you crossed over here. Well, that separates this piece from this piece. Right? And that's wonderful if you're talking about the whole chromosome. And now it's like, oh, we got these genes now. These alleles of these versions of these genes now are combined with these other versions of these other genes on the other, on the other chromosome. All right. Yeah, that, that happens. But we're talking about one gene. We're talking about all of this. Oops. We're talking about all this just being in 10,000 base pairs, all right? 10,000 base pairs. How often does crossing over happen within the space of just 10,000 base pairs? So that crossing over typically occurs between genes. We're talking about within genes. How often does it occur within genes? Because that's what young earth creationists need. They need crossing over to occur inside the space of a single gene because they need to recombine a piece of this, the portion of the gene with another portion of the other copy of the gene from the other individual so that you can bring together different variants creating a new haplotype. How often does that occur? It's measurable. Yeah, it is. Right? The general rule of thumb is um, if uh, there's there's if you measure lots and lots of fruit flies and look at multiple characteristics that are known to be on the same chromosome and you look at their you mate things and look at their offspring you can use mendelian genetics to predict like what ratio you should get right of each one of those different uh, phenotypes and then when you see individuals that don't have those characteristics in combination because they should be linked together but they they're not linked together well every time they're not linked together it's because they crossed over and they separated those alleles onto different chromosomes Right, so you can do tens of thousands of measurements. The frequency at which crossing over occurs is usually measured in something called centimorgans. And one centimorgan distance between the genes means there's a 1% chance, right? A 1% chance of crossing over occurring. So for every 100 times you do meiosis, one time out of every hundred, you'll observe that crossing over event occur. You see that those two alleles got disconnected from each other because it got crossed over between them. One percent. What is that one percent equivalent to in terms of the distance between those two genes? One percent is about a million base pairs. In human, in the human population, it's been measured to be like typically on most chromosomes, a one percent crossing over rate between two genes, all right, measurable crossing over rate, means that those two genes are about a million base pairs apart from one another. Now, if two genes are on the other ends of the chromosomes, if you have a gene, um, sorry, if you have a gene here and you have a gene down here, uh, crossing over is gonna occur so many times in here, more than 50% of the time. So that means half of every single meiotic event crossing over is going to separate this allele. So if you had like an, an A here at this particular gene and you had an A here, and on the other chromosome you had a T and you had a T, well, the A is going to get recombined with the T and the T is going to get recombined with the A because the crossing over 50% of the time. So if it's 50% or more, you know that the genes are way far apart. Right? They're, they're tens of millions of base pairs apart. But if it only happens one time out of every hundred different crossing events, then you know your genes are only about a million base pairs apart, which means they're pretty tightly linked together. It means that most of the time, 99% of the time, those two alleles get passed down to the next generation together from parent to offspring. All right, now let's go back to our gene. I just said it's 10,000 base pairs long. Some genes are 100,000 base pairs long. Some genes are 10,000. Some are much smaller than that. So we take this 10,000. If it were 100,000 base pairs in size, how often would you predict that it would cross over? 
right? If, if every million base pairs gets crossed over 1% of the time, something that's only 100,000 base pairs apart. So think of the one end of the gene versus the other end of the gene. There are 100,000 base pairs apart. How often will crossing over happen within the gene? One-tenth of 1% 1 of the time. Right? One-tenth of 1%. One right? Or one one-thousandth. One out of every thousand events will you have a crossing over event there. So for Adam and Eve, for this particular gene, for it to get scrambled and to create new haplotypes, new phenotypes uh, from that, it's only going to happen one every thousand, one out of every thousand times, right? They make sperm or egg or one out of every thousand offspring. Are going to you're going to observe that in they're only going to have 15 offspring so chances are none of their offspring are going to show any recombination in this particular gene oh but that was if the gene was a hundred thousand base pairs long i said it was ten thousand base pairs long so if it's ten thousand base pairs long it's one one hundredth of one percent right or one out of every ten thousand meiotic events all right Actually, I think that's actually one out of every 10,000 observed offspring, right? One out of every 10,000 observed offspring, right? So Adam and Eve are going to have 20 kids, highly unlikely, right? You wouldn't predict that any of them will show any crossing over in this particular gene, which means they're only passing down four possible groups, four haplotypes. Adam's giving either all blues or the other chromosome. Eve's giving all grays or the other chromosome. Which means their kids are getting like whole blocks. In other words, it's just like my first example, which I said was simple. But in fact, that's the reality. It is that simple. And because it's that simple for a single gene, it's going to get it's going to lose its variation very fast. Right, in a very small population that's highly inbred. In other words, homozygosity is going to go crazy in just a few generations. Young patients just throw this word around like, oh, recombination, right? It's just going to reshuffle and remix, and right, uh, and 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 therefore you're going to create all these new genotypes. But that the stats don't back that up. Right, one out of every ten thousand. So Adam and Eve has kids, their kids have kids, their kids have kids, their kids have kids. And maybe, and so once they've had 10,000 kids, all right, 10,000 kids, grandchildren, great, 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 grandchildren. Once you have a population with 10,000, you could say probably one person out of those 10,000 has managed to have a crossing over event. And reshuffled the variants on those two and created a new haplogroup which now recombines something from adam and eve's chromosomes creating potentially new phenotypes one out of every ten thousand and unfortunately that still might not really help you out why because by the time but if this doesn't happen until the great 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 grandchildren and that magical event occurs, like crossing over just happened to finally happen in this particular gene. What if that person was homozygous when it happened? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> what if that individual was homozygous? Let's go back here. What if that individual was Kane Jr.? What happens when Kane Jr. has a crossing over event in that particular gene, but that gene has exact same copies from both parents? Crossing over doesn't dilly squat for you. It doesn't do anything. It's like crossed over, recombined. You're like, but I had the same thing I had before. I am, I'm no different than I was before. The crossing over did nothing for me. So if you get to homozygosity before crossing over, crossing over doesn't do you a whole lot of good. Recombination doesn't do you any good. All right, so there's a population genetic problem here for a young earth creationist. This created heterozygosity thing that's going to somehow uh, front load massive amounts of genetic variation in, in organisms. Um, even if we grant that you could have enormous amounts of variation 
in just a few individuals, which there's a whole bunch of genetic reasons why that, that seems unlikely too, um, uh, just in terms of uh, just a bunch of things about uh, translation and regulation and all kinds of stuff, right? Uh, these genes can be that different. Um, but even if we granted that as a possibility, um, there's going to be a tremendous loss of that variation. And, and then you got to get through the flood. You got to get to the flood. And then what happens at the flood? You have a giant bottleneck. And then younger creationists like to say, like, well, what was preserved on the ark was uh, were individuals that had the most variation. We're all like super heterozygous. It had super heterozygous. Well, where did God find those individuals? By the time you got to the ark, 1600 years later, after the, after the original creation, and you've had this type of stuff happening and you look at each individual gene and the likelihood of crossing over happening inside of genes, because most of the space in the genome is between genes, right? 98% of the space, which means 98% of crossing happens not in genes. All right, so super unlikely, right? you're going to end up with heterozygosity, uh, sorry, homozygosity in lots and lots of genes with those starting conditions of small populations. Uh, then you're going to reach the flood. And then you're going to have this giant bottleneck where you're going to, you're going to only select a few individuals from the population to, to, be, to go through that, uh, that bottleneck. And what are you going to select from? You're not going to be able to find organisms that have massive amounts of genetic diversity in them. All right? Or heterozygosity in them. Um, and even if you did, you got the same problem after the flood. You got the same problem after the flood. Crossing over can only get you so far in terms of expressing the variation within genes. And yet we look at populations today and we look out at the human population or whatever species you want to think about. And you ask yourself, how many different haplogroups are there for an individual gene? And it'd be like, oh, there's dozens, hundreds hundreds and hundreds of individual separate haplogroups. You've got one. I've got a different one. I've got a slightly different version of this particular gene. I've got these variants that you don't have. Right? You can't say that 90% of those came from the original creation when you don't have enough crossing over to get the original created heterozygosity exchanged with the separately created chromosomes. Right? They've been essentially separate through history with rare events of mixing with each other. So here's what I, I think this is a, a common misconception because crossing over happens a lot. Right, It happens every single time organisms reproduce in every single chromosome. I, you know, once in a while it probably doesn't, but it also happens more happens more than in more than I'm sorry, in more than one place on many chromosomes. So certainly on average it's at least one per chromosome. So let's say 40, uh, sorry, 23 crossing over events per generation, right? Or per new in, new um, new offspring. And so crossing over has happened billions and trillions and trillions and trillions of times. And that sounds like that'd be really helpful. And it is, but the vast majority of that is between genes. And it's within genes that you need to have the crossing over occur. And crossing over occurring within genes can create a variety of different problems, right? They create their own mutational issues. Um, and so in a way, you'd really rather not have crossing over happen like inside your genes themselves, because that's where you get slip strand uh, stuff happening where you introduce small indels in, in insertions of bases or deletions. Uh, that creates frame shift mutations, which are generally really bad for the gene. Okay. Was there anything else I was going to say? Well, I had a bunch of other quotes. Uh, okay, this is toward the end of... I think maybe I can sum it up by using Jensen to try to sum this up. In summary, since the genotype results above, all these figures that he's produced, argue for the creation of heterozygous individuals. He's making an argument based on observations of the world today and how much, how many variations there are, how many single nucleotide polymorphisms there are, and how many different variants there are, versions of genes there are spread across the population. And then saying like, eh, mutations couldn't have created all these. And we've only got 6,000 total years because we know that's true because of the Bible. And therefore, 
the original organism also had a lot of variation. It had to be built in. God had to have formed it. Um, they went underwent further mutation after creation, right? So he's, they are saying that some new variants are actually the result of mutations. And since shifts towards homozygosity appear to have been occurring for the entire history of each kind, so yes, if you start out with massive heterozygosity, like super high amounts of heterozygosity, then I guess you could expect that heterozygosity is decreasing. And yes, you can dig up lots of studies that show that certain populations and certain species alive in the world today are, are becoming more homozygous over time. But I would counter that also with studies of organisms that are becoming more heterozygous right, uh, over time. There's, there's lots of different uh, factors in, in where, uh, in, in the direction of genetic diversity within species. Uh, it's theoretically straightforward to produce a large diversity of species in just a few thousand years. I guess I better back up. Um, let's read the whole thing in sequence. In summary, since the genotype, genotype results above argue for the creation of heterozygous individuals who underwent further mutation after creation, and since shifts towards heterozygosity, homozygosity appear to be occurring during the entire history of each kind of organism, it's theoretically straightforward to produce a large diversity of species in just a few thousand years first via the CHNP model. It makes it sound so easy, doesn't it? Furthermore, in the 4,365 years since the flood, it's very specific, isn't it? And in light of the timing of speciation and our simulations above, the highest levels of heterozygosity were likely present imminently following the flood. Um, the highest levels? I mean, think the highest levels will be at the actual creation itself. And then I've already shown you that uh, that is going to end up going toward homozygosity, which even, even uh, Jensen admits that all populations are going heterozygosis to, to homozygosity. So by the time you get to the flood, how are you going to have the flood be the most heterozygous event? I, but remember, he doesn't want to invoke miracles. He doesn't want ad hoc miracles. He wants to explain it based on natural processes. And yet I hear creationists all the time say that, well, you know, God went out and he selected because he brought the animals to the ark, which sounds like a miracle. And I think most creationists actually do consider that to be miraculous, right? That that's not something they naturally would do. It's just like, oh, two of two of a kind. They're the only two that had this idea. I, I should head over to the ark. <laughs> right? So that is hard to explain naturally. And so you'd say that's a miracle. So then what you can say from there is like, oh, well, well, maybe the two that were influenced by God to go to the ark are like, um, let's say it's the let's say it's the dog kind It's like, let's take a or cat kind. Let's take a lion, male lion and a uh, um, a uh, African wild cat female. And those two are the two that come to the ark. Right? They're very different phenotypically. So presumably genetically, they're very different from one another, but they're in the same kind. Uh, and so we put those on the ark because they'll have the most variation contained within them that they can then, but are they heterozygous or are they simply different from each other? Um, furthermore, in the 4,265 years since the flood, the highest levels of heterozygosity were likely present immediately following the flood and genetic drift and other processes likely diluted this concentrated heterozygosity to lower levels. Yes, genetic drift tends to reduce uh, genetic diversity as well. Consequently, the highest potential for dramatic reshuffling of allelic diversity was immediately following flood, implying the highest potential for phenotypic change and speciation was also in the first years immediately following the flood. This is the idea that there was a burst or radiation of species like right after the flood. So the population started really small and then as it uh, uh, reproduced and then moved into different locations that had different environments, uh, and they were reshuffling their genetic variation, right? So they were like popping up all kinds of different combinations of genes and expressing them. And then the environment's like, oh, that variation works pretty good here. And that variation works pretty good there. And that variation works there. And then they reproduce with each other. And then they produce more and more. They're the same and they become more homozygous. And they're like kind of adapted to those environments. That's, that's the idea. Thus, the CHNP model may also explain the burst of speciation recorded in the tertiary. This is an admission from Jensen that he believes that the flood, post-flood boundary is way down at the tertiary, below the tertiary, which would be the, uh, the, the uh, um, Cretaceous-Paleogene uh, boundary. 
right? The 65 million year old uh, asteroid impact layer. So everything above that is post-flood, uh, which you can get huge fights among young Earth creationists about whether that is the post-flood world or not. But here, here Jensen's employing the large amount of speciation that's recorded in the rocks of the tertiary, which he believe is not from the flood. These are fossils that were produced by individuals that got off the ark, and as they're reproducing and turning into different species, they're being captured by local catastrophes and turned into fossils. All right? Yeah, billions of fossils were made after the flood in the young earth create in the answers and genesis creation model institute for creation research over there it's like no 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 all that's flood rock uh if indeed the post -flood, the flood post flood boundary is located at the kt in summary we anticipate that the vast majority of metazoan kinds metazoan created types of organisms perhaps nearly all eukaryotic kinds will eventually be shown to derive 90%, I knew this 90% was somewhere, I forgot I copied this, 90% of their intrakine genetic diversity. So even if you consider like all the canines, all 35 living species today, I would say there's a lot of variation and a lot of genetic diversity within wolves. But if you add the genetic diversity of wolves to African wild dogs, to red foxes, to coyotes, to, dink, you know, all those, and you put that all together, every single variant there, Jensen is claiming that 90% of all that variation contained in all those species had to be crammed down into two individuals that were on the ark, two canines on the ark. Right? Massive created genetic heterozygosity. Except that the ark wasn't creation, right? Right? The original creation is way back then, so there's 1600 years, and somehow canines main, some canines maintain this massive genetic diversity load. <laughs> I'll call it diversity load. <laughs> it's like too much diversity. And they, they managed it all the way to the ark. And then after the ark, <laughs> they let it just let it go, right? Separated it out into all these different species. Okay, so 90%. Which, which, which is also, uh, you flip that around, that means 10% of the genetic diversity seen in, in a, a kind of organism or 10% of all the variations in human beings are what? Not from creation. God didn't make those directly. They're mutations. They were generated by natural processes and added to the gene pool, added genetic variation. But of course, that's not new genetic information. And that can't make new, real new things. Let's not go down that rabbit trail. If this turns out to be true, then converting one kind into another kind would appear impossible apart from miraculous genetic intervention. Since scripture records no such event, our model naturally explains why kinds cannot be converted into other kinds. He's saying that because most of the variation was created for a particular kind, and only 10% of the variation is being is added new in 6,000 years, um, there's not enough new variation to make something new because obviously God gave all the variation that he wanted the kind to have. So however they use it, they can't make another kind out of that 90%. Jensen's like implying that the only way to make a new kind would be to add something new to a kind in order to make it different from that kind from the other members of the kind. And so that would come from mutations. And you say, meh, but you know what? There aren't that many mutations. You know, once again, I'll say, I think I said earlier, Maybe young Earth creation, maybe genes don't have a problem and, and would, would scratch his head if you said, like, we're going to be around for another million years. In another million years, in a model that only accepts that we've been around 6,000 years and we've made 10% of the, 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 the genetic variation in the population is from mutations in just 6,000 years, what's going to happen in a million years? An immense amount of genetic variation will have been created, dwarfing the original variation that God created in those kinds. Right. And that's where they're going to spin that off into genetic entropy. And we're all going to be dead anyway, because species can't survive that long because we're decay. Since scripture records no such event. Oh, I just read that. OK. Um, as I said before, I just I'm just playing around with these graphics. I'm trying to find simple ways to demonstrate genetic variation and what can happen. Genetic variation from generation to generation. 
and I'm thinking about this whole created heterozygosity uh, issue. And I'm realizing now that I've tried to explain it, that I need to make a different graphic that, that expresses this idea of variation within a single gene. Because I think that's where the crux of the issue is. What's happening in a single gene? Um, and then I think I actually want to explore too when we have genetic duplications. So in many different kinds where there's many different species, some species have dozens of copies of a particular gene. Those are all mutations. And then you can have recombination. All right, so interesting things uh, happen there. Um, but for, for this particular example of just like created heterozygosity, uh, working with a single gene and trying to express like, okay, now let's mathematically, let's work this out. What will happen from generation to generation? What are the chances of having crossing over? What are the real chances of having genetic, how much genetic diversity can be created in say 50 generations or 100 generations or let's say young earth creationist realistic generation numbers. Um, and I'm pretty confident this is going to be a serious problem for young earth creationist population genetic. Uh, yeah, let's stop there. That's enough of my rambling for a day. Uh, hey, Zach, if you're still watching, if you've tried to watch this at all, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, shoot me an email. Uh, maybe we could talk about this further. Maybe you could, you can uh, correct my ways here. Like show me all the things I've said that are wrong. Uh, yes, I know I've, I've mixed up the terms, uh, allele, uh, and genotype, phenotype, and, <laughs> and haplotype, uh, multiple times, uh, already. Okay. Thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.